24 and the other from Acts 1, which is really describing the same thing, the same time, and by the same author. So we go to Luke 24, and we'll just read 44 through 49, where Jesus speaks to his disciples when he appeared there for the first time. They thought they'd seen a spirit, and then the He was given some fish and honeycomb and he eat before them. And then verse 44. And he, that is Jesus, said to them, his disciples, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus is it, it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And then we turn to Acts chapter 1. The first eight verses. And you see the connection right away in the beginning. The first one. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments and to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is the word of God this afternoon to us. Let's sing together from as we this morning considered seeking Christ and finding him. This afternoon we will consider having found him, having found Christ, be witnesses of Christ. Those two phrases you found as we read Luke 24 and Acts 1, verse 8 particularly, I want to read that again, Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part 
of the earth. Here we read, you shall be witnesses. In Luke 24, if you, I don't know if you noticed that, but he said, you are my witnesses. In other words, I called you to be witnesses. I made you a witness, a witness then to be. So that's our theme, be witnesses of Christ. We want to consider first his promise, then his power, and then his people. First is promise. And, and the first part of that, I would like to, to emphasize that is based on historical facts. Many people consider what we read in, in the Old and the New Testament myths or whatever fables, but we find repeatedly debunked throughout Scripture. It's based on historical facts. This book is called The Acts of the Apostles. I remember thinking about that. Maybe we should call it The Acts of God or The Acts of the Holy Spirit. And that is true. It is not just human history. It is God's story, His story. Another way of reading the word history. It's His story. And yet, even though it is God who works it all from the beginning to the end, he does it by means of witnesses. In the Old Testament, prophets. In the New Testament, apostles. And all those who became believers. They were scattered around abroad to bring the word of God to the ends of the earth. It's the almighty God who saves through Jesus Christ. And that's how it begins. The former treatise, Have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Began to do and to teach. And it says the former treatise, account or history. But really the word there in the original is logon. It's the same as logos. So the former word, have I made, a written, Luke is writing here, Theophilus, I, I wrote to you already the gospel. Now I write to you what follows the gospel. The gospel according to Luke. It's historical facts. If you go back to Luke 1 a moment, and you'll see there, in Luke 1, what, he writes to the same person, to Theophilus. He says in verses 1, through four of Luke 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things that are most surely believed among us. Note, note how emphatic he, he writes, even as they delivered them to us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So it's not a myth. It's not a fable. It's historical fact. It's confirmed to people from outside the, the Bible writers, secular writers in those days, Jewish writers, Gentile writers. And here is this the Theophilus. We, we don't know for sure who that man is. It's called here in Acts, most excellent Theophilus. Likely a, a Roman official had the name, this name, this honorable name. And it literally means friend of God or loved by God. A Roman official who maybe just like that centurion in Acts 10 came to faith as a Gentile in the Messiah who had come to Israel. You already see, slowly but surely, more and more people from the outside come in. The gospel expanded. Someone even wrote that Theophilus may have been a patient of Luke. Luke was a physician, a medical doctor. 
Paul writes that in Colossians 4.14 when he says, Look, the beloved physician greets you. Look and Paul knew each other. But the promise is not only based on historical facts. It's more surely built on God's character. What he promised in the Old Testament, he fulfilled in the New. And as faithful as he was in death, so he will be in what's coming. God's character, I am that I am. I do not change. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. All that Jesus began, he continues. God and his son will not cease to do what they have started. He will perfect that which he had begun. Jesus began to do it. Jesus is the same as Joshua. Yahweh saves. Joseph had, was told to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But at that point, perhaps Joseph didn't realize that his people meant more than just the Jews. It took a while for them to, to realize and to accept that. They were rebuked many times. Where they were sitting down dejected. When the Lord Jesus appeared to them, also in Luke 24, a little earlier, the verse 25, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have testified. All that I even reminded you of. In Acts 1 verse 3, that he showed himself with many infallible proofs. Infallible means it cannot fail. It won't end. And they knew that they could have known and they should have known what the Messiah's coming was all about. They had the Old Testament. They had the Lord Jesus repeatedly quoting from the Old Testament and teaching them. And still, they didn't seem to grasp it. Back to the Word of God. If there's any theme that keeps coming back, it's back to the Word of God. What He says. That's true. Acts 1 verse 4, wait for the promise, the promise of the Father. Wait for the promise of the Father. And Luke 24, 44, all things written in the law, the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. All things written, the law, the Psalms and the prophets. That's pretty much the whole Old Testament. Concerning me, he says. The scripture was not only about do's and don'ts and, and, and about Israel, but it was about the Lord Jesus, the Messiah to come, the Christ, the anointed one. You are witnesses of these things. These things that I taught you, these things that were already prophesied in the Old Testament to be shared with the world. connects the gospel according to Luke with the book of Acts. The end of the gospels into the Acts of the apostles. It's a third aspect of this, this promise, not only based on historical facts and built on God's character, but also in the book of Acts, bridges the gap. Bridges the gap from the Gospel of John to the book of Romans. The word witness here is mentioned, and throughout the book of Acts, the word witness is meant, mentioned 29 times, either as a verb, action word, or as a noun. 
29 times. It's a key word, not just for this passage, and not just for the book of Acts, but really for the whole word of God. It's all about witness. It's all bearing testimony, declaring who God is for sinners. It's a key word. Peter and John, when they were told to be silent, they said, we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. Just imagine these disciples, fearful disciples, hiding, trembling, becoming fearless disciples and apostles. Imagine. Imagine the book of Acts not to be in the Bible. Just imagine that it would have gone just from John to Romans. What we would be missing out on. The book of Acts is crucial. We go to Romans 1 and we read about Paul, the apostles. Like, who is Paul? All that they knew of Paul was that he was a persecutor. Now an apostle? Without the book of Acts, he wouldn't have known. When and how did the Holy Spirit come? If we go from John to Romans, what happened to the promise of the Holy Spirit? Without the book of Acts, we wouldn't have known. And you can find out many firsts that you read in the book of Acts or the book of the Holy Spirit proclaimed through the apostles. How do we get deacons? Acts 6. How do we get elders? How did the Gentiles get included? Yeah, Acts 2 is the pouring out of all th- on all flesh, but it didn't happen until Acts 10 and 11 that Peter finally resisted that they finally stopped resisting, I should say, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Remember when he saw that vision and he had to eat unclean animals? That had nothing to do with unclean animals. It had to do with him having to go to a Gentile home. Cornelius in Acts 10. There were even some of the elders had to come along with him later on to testify that it was really God's work. We read in Acts 11, verse 18, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life. Without the book of Acts, we would have known all that. But the book of Acts bridges that gap between the gospel accounts and the epistles. How would the church in Corinth start? Many other churches we would have known. What happened to the covenant sign and seal of circumcision? Changed into baptism. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Lord Jesus prophesied about that it would happen. But without the book of Acts, we would not have known where and how it happened. Many firsts. In the book of Acts, also the first persecutions, Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians. And you know how we call them, children, martyrs. You've heard of martyrs, people that die because of their faith, but the word martyr actually means simply witness. We're all to be martyrs. That doesn't mean we all have to die witnessing of the Lord Jesus, but we have to live it. To be a martyr simply means to be a witness, whether it be life, by life or by death. So we see we're called to be witnesses of Christ. First we see his promise. Now we would like to see his power. His power. So the Lord not only promised that we would not only be witnesses, but be enabled to be witnesses, but also his power. He both promised and provided the power 
the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the first aspect that I want to think about is power here. Because the disciples had not yet at this moment received it when we read in Acts 1. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come. And we read that they started to pray together for the Holy Spirit to come. So, as it were, they were praying by the Spirit for the Spirit. They were persuaded by, by the working of the Holy Spirit through Jesus' words to prayerfully expect it. They were not just sitting idly by. We read in verse 14, we didn't read it now, but 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication before the Spirit was poured out. They were already, through the prompting of the Spirit, praying for the Spirit. I find that such a beautiful picture. When we are praying as believers, wrestling with whatever it may be, the very conviction of being drawn to pray is by the Spirit, for the Spirit to give a greater awareness or reality or power or presence of comfort. Convicted in order to be comforted and converted by the Spirit, for the Spirit. So it's very clear that the Holy Spirit didn't begin to work at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was present really from the very beginning of the Old Testament. He was present at creation. Genesis 1-2, we read, The Spirit of God moved upon the waters. We just sang from Psalm 33 about God's Spirit, his breath, when he speaks. Children, when you speak and you hold your hand in front, what do you feel? You feel the, the breath coming out of your mouth. When we speak, it's our breath. So the word for spirit and breath and wind is often the same word in the Greek, as well as in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. So the Spirit of God can also be referred as the breath of God or the wind that, Nic that Nicodemus, where the wind blows. But in other words, Nicodemus, I'm talking to you. I am the one. And because I'm talking to you, the wind is blowing. The Spirit is moving. Every time when you open the Bible and you read it, children, even you read the Bible to yourself or when your parents read it to you, it is actually God speaking. And the Spirit blowing. To give us life. David knew that he needed the Holy Spirit and that he was saved by the Holy Spirit when he had sinned against Bathsheba. He writes in Psalm 51, he says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Clearly the Old Testament is full of examples that the Holy Spirit was already at work. In John 20, verse 22, after his resurrection, before he ascended, Jesus said to his disciples, or we read of him in, in John 20, verse 22, that Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, pre-Pentecost. And we read in verse 2 here, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So he commanded them through the Holy Ghost to pray for the coming of the Holy Ghost. So it's very plain that the Holy Spirit was present throughout the ages, but it was limited mostly to the Jews. There were some Gentiles brought in, but not many that we know of anyway in the Old Testament. So the Holy Spirit was present yet coming in a more powerful manifestation than he had ever seen before. Present, yet coming. Praying through the Spirit, for the Spirit. And so they're still present even today, and yet coming. Still working, even today. 
even when the word of God is being proclaimed right now. So that we too would be commanded, invited, convicted to confess our sin and to confess Christ, to be witnesses of him to other people. Every time the word comes, the Holy Spirit strives with us. The wind is blowing. Nicodemus didn't get it. But undoubtedly afterwards he did. Because he was also present to bury the Lord Jesus when Jesus had died. But of course at Pentecost it was extraordinary. Not that I say that in the Old Testament it wasn't extraordinary, but it was more ordinary in the sense it was limited. At Pentecost, we read that the Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. Upon all flesh. Jesus says in verse 5, baptized. John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Endued from power by power from on high. It says in Luke 4, 24, where we read, Behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye, wait means, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued, covered, filled, clothed with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father, which have heard of me. Endued or covered or filled or overcome with power from on high, clothed, covered, baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus makes it very plain for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. So if you want to talk about being immersed, it's not water. It's with the Holy Spirit. It's with the Holy Spirit. To be immersed in the Spirit, however, we must be immersed in the Word. God does it sovereignly, powerfully. Yet we, at the same time, are commanded and invited and privileged to make use of the means. The inspired, God-breathed Word We sometimes tend to separate the word from the spirit. And they're distinct, but they're not separate. To be immersed in the spirit, we must be immersed in the word of God. We cannot work a spirit revival. God does. But he does that by means of us using his word for ourselves as well as for others. Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. Every believer. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer as the very same Spirit who pricks the heart and who also fills the heart. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And He promises that very clearly to never ever leave us. Even though it may sometimes feel like that. But he says, I will take my abode in you and will never leave you. Never, no, never leave you. The gift of the Holy Spirit. So we talk about this power by the Spirit, for the Spirit, from indwelling to filling. So when we become a believer, the, the Spirit begins to dwell in us. But the more we are in the Word, the Spirit breathes Word, the more it will fill us to overflowing. How can we possibly have a vase that we fill with water halfway and wait till it overflows? It only will overflow if we keep filling it. It's God's work, but at the same time, He says, drink of the water of life. Eat of the bread of life. It will become visible. By the Spirit, for the Spirit, from indwelling to filling. 
and then from Jews to Gentiles. You see the expansion every time? It's not only about the Jews, but the Gentiles also. Joel 2, I will pour out, Joel 2, 28, quoted in Acts 2. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. Not only the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. From national to international, you would say. Begin with patriarchal, then national, and then international. That's the growing expansion of the power of the Holy Spirit. Manifesting itself in special way, of course, the Pentecost. But still at work today. Even though we can be very discouraged about what's happening in, in America and Europe and in, in the Western world, but when we see in the Southern Hemisphere how God's at work in many ways beyond our imagination. Truly, it's reaching the ends of the, of the world, even into small villages in Africa. From Jews to Gentiles, of all flesh, to the uttermost part of the earth, to the very ends. Luke 24, 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. All nations. It's so striking, right, that the Jews were claiming to be children of Abraham without realizing that every time they said the name Abraham, they actually said father of many nations. While they were claiming that he was their father only. Every time they would use the word Abraham, father of many nations. It's already pictured in the name of Abraham. That the blessing, Galatians 3, 4, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see that later on, on Acts 2, when Peter speaks, when the people were said, what men and brethren, what must you do? And they realized what they had done to Jesus. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There may have been people among them that cried, crucify him. And then he goes on to say, verse 39, For because the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then I love that next verse, verse 40. I would never dare say that if it wouldn't be in the Bible. It says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, that doesn't sound reformed. Save yourselves. That's why I said it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it if it wouldn't be in the Bible. But Peter said it on Pentecost. Flee the wrath to come, Jesus said. Take refuge before it is too late. From Jews to Gentiles. I find it very uh, remarkable here that it's a Gentile by the name of Luke who writes this all for us. Luke was a Gentile. It's remarkable think, to think about that. That the Lord not only used Luke to be a messenger, but even a very example of it. The gospel to come also to Gentiles. An illustration. Not only a witness, but also an illustration. It's very clear that we don't know really much about Luke except that he was a physician. But very clear that he wrote both the gospel according to Luke as well as the acts of the apostles. Well, we do know that he traveled with Paul. Many times you read it throughout the book of Acts that Luke and Paul, at some times they were separated and then they got together again. Sometimes you read we when Luke writes, then he's included. Sometimes you read they, when he writes about Paul and his companions, then clearly he was not included at that time. Read through the book of Acts next time, you'll see that. In and out, Luke comes in and out, being part of it. A Gentile and a Jew working together. 
to bring the gospel to all nations. It's a beautiful thing that, and I didn't really realize it, I, I suppose I may have known it at some point, but if you look at all the pages of the New Testament, then Luke is actually the one that wrote the most pages. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the books, but they are very small books. But Luke wrote more than Paul. Luke wrote more than John. Even if you would include in John's writings his gospel, his letters, and the book of Revelation, Luke wrote more. Even if you would include in all Paul's writings, even if you would include Hebrews, which is debatable, we don't know for sure, but many believe that Paul wrote that too. Even then, Luke wrote more. It's a Gentile who wrote to the world, to us today. I find that a beautiful picture to, to realize that, to bring sinners from all over the world, from all nations, into the kingdom, but not in the way the disciples expected. It took a while for them to, to grasp it. Peter was reluctant to go. The Christians were reluctant to go. It wasn't until persecution started that they were scattered abroad to preach the gospel, to be evangelizers, to be witnesses. Very reluctant to go. Do you recognize some of that? To speak to others about the Lord. Wouldn't it be if we would be more filled with the Holy Spirit and by His Word, if we would be more eager and ready to be those witnesses? So it says, be witnesses of me. Said, be witnesses of Christ, his promise, his power, but then also, third, his people. And his people I would then refer to as the kingdom. The kingdom was always there, but it was growing, it was small, it was limited. As I said earlier already, from patriarchal, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth, to the national, then it became Israel, the people of God, then now to international, the kingdom is being readied. Jesus told his disciples in verse 4, wait for the promise of the Father to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. And then you see this. You wonder in verse 6 how the Lord Jesus responded to that. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You think you still don't get it? That's how I used to respond to that. Until I realized how slow I was in getting it. Jesus just telling them that it's going to be the whole world. And then he says, they say, so when is it going to be that that kingdom is going to be restored to Israel? To Israel. In other words, when is the day coming back that we will have a king like David and Solomon and so forth? To restore Israel to its former glory. But in the meantime, the kingdom is being readied. It's being prepared Lord, when will we be able to get rid of those Romans? Calvin actually says something about here, about this for six. He says, Jesus cured their morbid curiosity by recalling them to present duty. You see that even today happening. People are making all kinds of speculations about the end times. What's going to happen? They, they read this and this earthquake and then the, the, the solar uh, eclipse and, and who, you name it, all these things happening and some people making all kinds of predictions. Well, you have to be aware of what's happening, but at the same time, our major duty is not to predict the future, but to be witnesses of a present Savior. This is the day the Lord has made, the day of His salvation. The kingdom is being readied. You see how Jesus gently responds. It's just almost 
picture the Lord Jesus before he says that <sighs> sighs. We don't read that, but I can almost imagine that, that the Lord Jesus, but he's so patient, so kind. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses of me. So he's, he's calling them from thinking about all these things to their current and present duty to be witnesses. Don't get yourself too wound up in all kinds of predictions. Focus on the simplicity of the gospel. Be witnesses of me, Jesus says. He says, it's not for you to know the times. The word there is chronology in the original, the order of things, or the seasons. The word seasons is more about duration, continuation, which the Father has put in his own power. The word there is authority. It's the Father's right to determine that. Because then you you read on, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There the word power in English looks like the same. In the end of verse 8, verse 7 rather, it says the Father put in his own power, in his own right, his authority. But you shall receive power, and that's a different word, that's might. The word dynamis, where we have the word dynamite from. So it's the Father's right, and he will give you the Holy Spirit to be powerful instruments in his hands. You don't need about, to worry about the future. Today, I call you to be my witnesses. And that same word comes to us today. Witnesses. As Zechariah 4, verse 6, not by might nor by power force there, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. In other words, we like to fight, we like to be warriors, but the Lord says, be my witnesses. Don't use a steel sword, but the the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6. The armor of God has only one offensive aspect, and that's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the power. Not by force, not by might, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. By proclaiming the gospel in all simplicity, children, young people, all the ones, to somebody at school, to somebody at work, in your neighborhood, you talk to a friend about it. Very simple. Do you do it? Are you willing to do it? Are you looking forward for opportunities to do it? You don't have to be a big light. Just a little light in a dark place goes a long way. If you would have no light, it would be in the middle of the night, clouds, and these lights fall out. If I would put one candle here, you would all be able to see me. Just a little light in a dark place goes a long way. A grain of salt goes a long way. We don't need a whole bunch of salt on our food. You don't put half of the food, whatever it is, and then the other half salt. You just sprinkle a little bit on it. What a picture that is of how we are to be witnesses of Jesus. But the kingdom being ready. The Lord Jesus spoke about it several times. The kingdom is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John the Baptist started the same way. It's near. It's coming. It's it's progressing. It's being processed. Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Jesus sent forth his disciples in Matthew 10. As you go, preach. Preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's being readied. Second part of this, the kingdom and God's people, the people that, of all nations that he will draw to himself, is not only the kingdom being readied, but also reformed. 
obviously, very clearly, very different it's going to be after Pentecost. It was so different, so against the grain of the people as they had been raised to realize that the gospel was now for the Gentiles as well, upon whom they looked down. It's going to be different. Same promise, same faith, same Savior, same gospel, but not just for the Jews, also for the Gentiles. Jesus said in John 17, the kingdom of God comes not with observation, show our power. Neither shall they say, look here, look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. He already told them way before the Spirit was poured out upon them. So the Holy Spirit is within you, but even the kingdom is within you. Make use of what you know. Share it with others. Be witnesses. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, All power is given to me in heaven. Remember that power that I spoke about? That power conveyed to his people, not a physical power, but a spiritual power. Not in our might, but in his might. All power, he says, is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, for that reason, because of that power, go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Be witness. Not with the sword of steel, but with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the kingdom about his people, the kingdom readied, the kingdom reformed, not changed essentially, but broadened, And then third, the kingdom realized. Realized. And we find it beautifully described in the book of Acts. I might have earlier already mentioned something. If the book of Acts would not be there, we would miss a most essential part of the word. There would be many things we wouldn't know. Essential things. Mainly by using two men... Peter and Paul, Peter in the first several chapters, particularly the Jews, but then you see the shift from the Jews to the Gentiles. Peter himself reluctantly moved over, and then Paul added to it to be a specific witness to the Gentiles, written by a Gentile. Look. The first 12 chapters, still limited to the Jews, mostly about Peter But then the remaining chapters, 13 through 28, about the Apostle Paul breaking, as it were, into the nations around, traveling around, had to overcome many, many difficult obstacles. But he always started in the synagogue. And when they were were kicked out, many times happened, then they worshipped in other places. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven realized. Be witnesses of me. As simple as that. And for them, of course, it was to begin at Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that we have to travel to Jerusalem to start there. Really, apply to that simply means beginning where you live. Kindle on. Wherever you live, whatever your neighborhood is. Can you imagine? I wish I myself would be more on fire for these things I'm not just talking to you. I'm also talking to myself. If we would be more on fire for the Lord Jesus, each one of us individually, how many people could we witness to that we have neglected to do in the past? When I think about this, the older I get, the more and more I'm convicted in my sins, not only of commission, which I still do many. I'm not saying that I've reaped arrived at all, but particularly I'm more focusing and seeing in my life the sins of omission where I've not done what I should have done. 
I've neglected to do when I had a prompting that I should talk to this one or, or a thought in my mind about a certain person and, and phone call or, or going for a visit or whatever. Come alongside. The promptings of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit prompts us to think about a certain person, maybe you know about that person that is he or she is going through a hard time. Why not call that person a visit? When you're walking down the street and you see a neighbor just working out in his yard. It's springtime. What a beautiful illustration to say. Isn't it amazing that we talked about it with some of you. Look at this, this, this nature picture. Like all of winter, it looked so dead. You think these trees will never bloom, blossom, and give, bring forth leaves again. Every spring, we see this miracle, life out of death. What a beautiful connection you could make there. That's a picture of the gospel. Are you a Christian? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And then engage in a conversation. And maybe not the first time everything, just a, a few words, and maybe next time you see that person again, you could continue the conversation. You don't know what the outcome will be. But that's how the word of God would be scattered to the ends of the earth. I've read that most likely, almost certainly, more people were saved in the ancient church by person-to-person -person witness than by people that came to listen to Paul or Peter or the other apostles. One Christian talking to another person. They were scattered abroad like seed. When they left, when they fled persecution in Jerusalem, and we read that they preached the word, the word there is evangelized, witnessing the gospel. So how to apply that to ourselves is what I already mentioned, is seek to be a witness. First, as we heard this morning, seek the risen Christ, serve the risen Christ, and to see him not only in your own life, but in the lives of others as well, by witnessing to them. That's the message of today. Seek, you shall find. Witness you will see fruit. You may not see it in your lifetime, but who knows? Maybe in heaven you will meet with somebody that you spoke to years ago and you gave up hope. You here, you here. Years later, you may have maybe made one comment and then another comment and maybe somebody else spoke to that person and several people gave up on that particular individual. But somebody may have witnessed to that person at a certain time, a certain moment, where all these previous witnesses came together. And the Lord saved another sinner. And you as a church have been, like English as a second language is a beautiful way. And there may be other ways in this conference that is coming and, and youth camp and many other things that, that they can, in our home, in our neighborhood, at work, at school, have conversations. Explain to people why you're a Christian and what the word Christian really means. Follower of Christ. One who did seek and find the Lord Jesus Christ and through him forgiveness of sins and peace with God and eternal life and hope and happiness and joy. Remember in prayer also a seminary where we have a, a great opportunity as a small denomination to spread the word across the world. Mission trips. In Grand Rapids there was a youth group that went to Mexico again last week. Just one Christian speaking to another person. We do not know what the outcome will be. And actually, I want to close with that. Just not too long ago I read a book um, even if none, Pastor Elsa uh, mentioned that to me, I read about this by Ryan Denton, even if none. It's about evangelizing, a biblical view of evangelizing. 
It was such a liberation for me that it helped me in many ways. Even if none simply means if nobody responds to your witness. Still witness. You see, it's up to us to witness. It's up to God that that witness may bear fruit. Do you realize what a relief that was for me? In preaching, in counseling, in witnessing to people, in, in being a pastor. I often felt I failed being able to persuade people to come to faith. <laughs> I don't have to. I have to be faithful in witnessing. The outcome is out of my hands. That's a relief. Makes it a lot simpler. Even if you think you failed that witness, it doesn't matter. You'll never do it perfectly anyway. <laughs> you'll always come short. You think maybe sometimes, I've had it many times, I stumbled through it and I thought, oh boy, it's, it's not good at all. I'm preaching and witnessing, and the Lord blessed it. And sometimes I thought I was very eloquent and it must have been very well done and nobody, nobody mentioned a thing about it. <laughs> it's so it's so countercultural, counterintuitive, but it makes it simple and liberating, even if none. That's what the title of the book is. Even if your whole life witness, remember Isaiah when he was called? Told ahead of time at the very beginning that nobody would listen to him. But he kept going. Isn't that encouraging? So seek him, you shall find him. Seek Christ, the risen Christ, you shall find him. And when you find him and begin to serve him and learn more and more about him, you will also increasingly witness of him. And words and actions, they listen to us, but they also watch us to see how it really relates in our lives. It's my wish for you as a congregation May the Lord bless it. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this incredible gift that not only we can't save ourselves, but we cannot save others either. But thanks be to thee, Lord, thou hast sent thy Son, thou hast sent thy Holy Spirit, thou hast sent thy Word, so that we may be witnesses. All we need to do is prayerfully share what we have learned from thy word and turn people to study, to search thy word. And then step back. Then realize that it is all in thy hands. As thou hast moved us to witness, whether people will respond to it with faith or not, it is not our responsibility. It is thine. And thou hast promised that thou wilt do with thy word more than we can, more than we can imagine. Because this word, this gospel, was spread by some uneducated disciples who became apostles. And within a very short period of time, it spread across the world of that time. And it is still spreading even today. And we thank thee for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.